morning, everybody. My name is Kaya Henderson, and I'm the former chancellor of DC Public Schools. And I am really excited to be here today um, with three dynamic gentlemen from Finland. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the Finnish education system because it could not be an education conference if we didn't talk about the <laughs> Finnish education system, right? Uh, so I'm gonna start by asking um, each of our guests to introduce themselves briefly and to say the one uh, reason why you think um, people are so excited about the Finnish education system. Passi, we'll start with you. Yeah, yeah let me go first. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me in this panel. There's actually one problem with this panel is that those people who would be the best people to talk about Finnish education are not here, mm -hmm. namely women. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a pretty much a, a female accomplishment in, in Finland. My name is Passi Salberg and I'm, I'm a Finnish educator and scholar and advisor. I've spent a lot of time here in the United States and other countries to, to um, advise and, and try to understand uh, about education. So I was a school teacher in the beginning and I've done teacher education, uh, education policy, all sorts of things uh, throughout my life. I think, you, you know, if, there's one, if I have to pick up one thing that kind of stands behind the, the Finland's reputation and why everybody's talking about Finnish education right now, it's something like all of those who were in the, in the morning keynote, you heard the um, uh, several people actually mentioning that in Finland education has for a long time been designed for everybody. So the system has been open for, for all the children and uh, people regardless where they come from and what their parents do for money. And so this has been a kind of a spirit of the reform since the 1970s. And I think we have been very loyal and, and, and kind of a persistent with, the, with the, this, this same idea. And um, uh, rather than you know, just talking about how important it is to have education that serves everybody that are here, particularly here in the United States and many other countries, is that education should be for everybody. I think what the Finns have done, we have actually done it. And, and for, just to give you one example that is a kind of a striking difference between this country and Finland is how we spend the money. That here, the, here the, 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 you often hear that people say that America is spending a lot of money in, in education. I think that's not an issue. Actually, that's not true. But what the issue is there, that the money here in this country and many other countries is, is, is spent in exactly the wrong way, so that the, the, the money for education is going to benefiting most of those who already have a lot. Okay. But in Finland, what we have done, we have done exactly the opposite, that we, we give more resources and help, and including money to those schools and communities and children who find it more difficult for one reason or the other to be successful. And you know, if you, if you work like this decade after decade, uh, you, you, can, you cannot get it wrong. And it's not only Finland, you know, if you think that Finland is too different and, and strange, as, it is, as you will hear from these colleagues from here, you, you just go to any other uh, high-performing successful education system and they do exactly the same. That the resources are going to the places where they're mostly needed. And Kaya, you know, you know this much better than any of us here, how important thing this is. But we, people, people need to understand that Finland has been doing that for the last 40 years already, very Can systematically. Say that, Can you say that one more time, please? <laughs> yeah, we, we have to be consistent and we have to kind of understand that the, the, the equity of this education system is the, the one that drives quality and the resources have to go to the places where they're mostly needed. Amen. Amen. Saku, <laughs> tell us why Finland is so hot. Uh, well, starting a brief introduction of myself, um, my big passion in life is innovation, making great things happen. And we've been working with Finnish schools now for four or five years, trying to identify great things that are happening in Finnish schools. And, and we have 100 innovations up and running in various kinds of schools on various areas of education, skills, assessment, learning environments, and so forth. So what we are trying to do is that we identify great things that are happening, then we evaluate why they are working, then we package them, and then we are trying to spread them with the world for free. Uh, and, and, and the next stage is that we are doing exactly the same globally. So not consisting all, concentrating only in Finland, but also on global innovations. And the pro name of the pro project is, is 100. But getting back to your question, uh, it can be divided too, because the original question was that why people are excited about Finland. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's quite easy, easy to answer to. And, and, and the answer is PISA. Because if there wouldn't be PISA, if there wouldn't be easy, Tell easy what the PISA is. Uh, PISA, so PISA is a, maybe, maybe the better expert. Expert, you, you can give a, 
explanation on to PISA. One, one sentence. PISA is the program for international student assessment that the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, has been running since year 2000. And in this first PISA yeah. that Saku mentioned, Finland became number one. Excellent. So Finland was number one in, in 2000. We were number one in 2003, 2006. And then, boom, there was a trend that Finland is, is the country to look up to. But I think that the more interesting thing is, is, is the reason uh, what, what's behind that one. And there, there's so many, many reasons. One is exactly, exactly the thing that Pasi mentioned, is that we have an education system which is concentrating both on excellence and equity. And we are quite good in, in both. But, but for me, if I'm adding something, something in here, I'd say the one word which I'm excited about is trust. So I'd say that in Finnish education system, uh, I think one could say is that the, the quality of the teachers in Finland is quite high. But, but that's not enough, as we know from any industry, is, is that if you're having great people, but you are not trusting them, you are not giving them any autonomy, you are not giving them any freedom, they leave, they are not motivated. So in Finland we have great teachers, but we trust them. So they are the best experts in the classroom to do the assessment, to do the development, to decide what kind of innovation do they want to use, and so on and so on. And unless you are having this kind of, this kind of combination, great quality of teachers and trust, I think it's extremely difficult to change the education system. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, so uh, keep it brief. So yeah, I'm Peter, and uh, before uh, uh, I used to be the Mighty Eagle at uh, Rovio and Angry Birds, so we made this little game, and then uh, over the last six years it's been downloaded like four billion times, so it's like uh, <laughs> quite a few. And, uh, and uh, then uh, after we got our movie out last year, decided it was like a good time to let kind of like rest of the team, uh, you know, keep working on Angry Birds and, and then start doing, you know, bigger and better things. So uh, one thing that we're doing now uh, at Lightyear, so a company started together with, uh, with Niklas, founder of Rovio, and then Lauri, who's sitting there in the green hoodie, so we have like different colors and everything. Uh, and then uh, uh, Lauri um, Contori, who started uh, Rovio Animation Studio uh, back in the day, so, so uh, basically uh, uh, we started uh, Lightyear to make uh, uh, learning fun and actually true games. So in Finland, yes, we have, uh, as we heard, a fantastic uh, kind of like educational system and fantastic schools. We also have uh, fantastic uh, game companies. So uh, not only Angry Birds, but you know, Supercell. They made like Clash of Clans, Clash Royale, uh, all of that. So we have uh, um, some talent in, in in that space. And uh, then we decided to bring these two things together and create fantastic games that also. Uh, at learning, and our first game is uh, Big Bang Legends. So if you play that game for like 15 minutes, uh, you'll get, uh, you know, basics of particle physics. And uh, yeah, basically what we're doing is uh, making particle physics uh, popular. So so that's kind of like what we're up to right now. And uh, yeah, then kind of like why why the Finnish education system is uh, uh, so good. Uh, I think that uh, I mean already, of course, the teachers are fantastic, and and we trust them. Uh, I think that's that's uh, very very important. Uh, but I think that also that we we kind of like uh, trust the kids, so uh, we give the kids kind of like lots of independence, and and I think that's something that is is very very important, and will be even more important uh, going forward. And I think that uh, the PISA stuff, uh, yeah, that's kind of like why people have been looking at, at Finland, but now uh, you also have high PISA scores, uh, you know, almost all across Asia, so Korea, Singapore, China. Uh, but I think like uh, there, uh, if you look at kind of the Asian model, uh, the results are achieved by like a lot, and I mean really a lot of hard work, very long school days, and uh, a lot of homework. And then in the Finnish model, very short school days, uh, and hardly kind of like any, any like homework at all. Uh, which means that you have uh, kind of like a healthy balance between school and life. And I think that is also uh, very important because uh, it's important for people that you can actually reflect over things. And it's not just like, you know, work, 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 but you also have to kind of like have some time to kind of like do other things. So, so that, that's also, I think, very important. I think one of the things, um, Saku, you talked a lot about trust. Well, you talked about, I like the way you linked the two things the quality of the teachers, right? The yeah. teachers are very high quality and trust and autonomy goes along yeah. with that. Um, you didn't wake up that way, right? At some point, Finland was not super performing on the PISA. Mm -hmm. And so how did you get to the point where you have all of these really high quality teachers that you trust? Uh, 
it, it's, a, it's a great question and, and you never know what leads to something. But like Pasi mentioned, uh, we made this reform in, in 1970s. And, and to be frank, the country was not extremely excited about it. There were mixed opinions about that one. We but, know something about that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then people were saying is that, yeah, but this kind of putting so much, so much emphasis on equity, for example, will destroy the competitiveness of Finnish society. So it will be all mainstream. But then it started to work. All the, all the research was back, backing the reform and so forth. And then sort of like a empowerment started to happen, which means that, wow, this is actually working. We are among the best ones in the world. And then one good thing led to another. Other, and and, and that, that's the way things change. There's a lot of discussion in the US, for example, about the themes that how do we know that it works? But to be frank, in any industry, we really don't. We know some basics about things that work in education, but the world is extremely uncertain. We don't really know what are the skills needed in 2030, 2040, 2050. And I think that uh, we cannot be only evaluating things, being extremely things, uh, on, on evaluation, studying is that how can, we total, how can we be totally certain that this works? I think another way to approach this is continuous improvement, having ambition to say is that yes, we have a strong feeling backed by research, is that this is the right direction. We accept the fact is that not everything works perfectly, but we have to develop and develop and develop because this is how the world changes in every industry. And I think in Finland we now have a great position because, because it seems to, there's, there's a saying, saying, if it works, don't fix it. And, and I think that there's never better time to fix it when it still works, mm -hmm. because when it's broken, it's really compl complicated to fix. But it's difficult because there's so many people who are saying that, yeah, yeah, but it's working great. How, how do you improve? So I think now in Finland, the, the main question is how, like the theme of this topic is that now that the education system is working so well, how can we keep improving it? How can we have the boldness to make decisions? And I think that it goes back to the confidence that is coming from doing new things and finding out that they work. Yeah. So I want to talk about this culture of innovation, but Pasi, what were the reforms in the 70s that got us here? Yeah, if I, if I continue from this, because as I said, I was a teacher, I was teaching math and science for many years in the 1980s and early 1990s. But you know, the, 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 whole, the whole Finnish story is a very simple. It's a kind of a basic, there's no secrets or okay. kind of a magic there. It's, it's a very sim know. simple thinking that I, I always try to sell here in the United States. You know, the, don't complicate things, that, just keep it simple and, and, and things will work. And you know, if you, if you go back to the, the early time of the, when this big change happened in the early 1970s, you know, there were a couple of things like, first of all, there, were, there was a kind of a common understanding that we also heard this morning um, in the keynotes that anybody can learn that anybody can learn if, if we have right conditions and circumstances for that. That's what, what most of the teachers in Finland understood. And then we also required, insisted that we cannot segregate schools. That all these children coming from different backgrounds and, and different, uh, different mindsets, that they, they have to be taught in the same school and in the mixed classrooms. That is again something that is a kind of a revolutionary idea that, that we don't segregate children by their, their, their abilities or skills or or family background, anything like that, that we insisted that every classroom has to be socially mixed. And it's a very simple, the conclusion is very simple, is that you can only do that if you have well-prepared and trained teachers. Teachers have to be educated in a different way so that they not only can teach their math and Finnish language and other things, but that they understand what is going on in a socially mixed classrooms. And therefore, we, we decided after a kind of a, uh, some sort of debate in the 1970s to upgrade the teaching profession to, um, to the same level as lawyers and doctors and all the others so that everybody m must have a master's degree in a research universities. That Finland is one of the very few countries that is actually doing that and Finland is the only country that has done that since the 19, late 1970s. And I think that that, you know, that brings the story very quickly to the trust that if you have well prepared professionals like, just think about, I don't know if we trust lawyers. <laughs> so much, let's but, say we trust, but we trust doctors. let's take another profession like like medical doctors or dentists. I think most of us here we are fairly confident that if you, if your dentist or medical doctor has a degree from any recognized university and some practice that we can I'm, I'm confident to hear you know what the advice is about my health or my conditions. Um, 
And it should be, we wanted to have the same thing in, in, in our schools, that all the parents would feel confident and, and, and kind of trust the, 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 the teachers who are teaching, because they knew, parents knew, in fin and they know now in Finland, that the teachers, primary school teachers and all the others have a similar type of training. They go to the same universities and they're expected to do exactly the same type of academic rigor than all the others. Uh, so, so the trust that Saku was talking about is, is a kind of a result of that kind of a realization in the 1990s that we had enough people there running our schools, including school principals, who had, you know, advanced academic training and preparation. I was a teacher that time and I remember uh, I was one of those uh, active teachers who were kind of a, um, loudly asking the authorities and politicians to give us more authority and, and trust us. Just, and we said, I remember, remember saying that just, you know, if, we, if, you, if you let us do and teach as we think we should teach these kids, we can give you much better results than if we have to do what you ask us to do. And so there was a, this was like a nationwide movement in the early 1990s. Teachers and schools were saying that just let's, let us teach, like many teachers here in America are now saying that, so, so why don't you just let us teach, do our job? And, and this is a, one way that Finland, you know, we, we had a smart authority that time to kind of a step back and say that, okay, teach you know, show us what you can do. And of course, you know, if you go back to the 1990s when this happened, of course some people, some schools and some teachers made mistakes. Uh, but it's exactly the same in a, in a, in a business where they, these guys are. That if you, if you are afraid of making mistakes, you will never really get anywhere. And that was a kind of, a, it was a very smart move by the authorities and politicians to say that, okay, we can tolerate mistakes, but we have a system that is able to help those individuals or schools or communities that make mistakes. So rather than, you know, investing a lot of resources and attention to testing kids and accountability and all those things that have nothing to do with learning, we invested our resources to identify and help those individuals and schools and communities that were not able to kind of perform and, and, and do those things properly. So, you know, in the end, I st still want to underline that the, the, this Finnish story, all of those here in this room, if you have a kind of a mystical idea of Finnish education that they have somehow figured out where the secret is, that's not true. We, have, we, we, we really went back to the basics and, and understood that the, the education is about the relationships, it's about trust, it's about professionalism, and just, you know, letting people to do the right thing. Yeah, but I think an untold part of that story is how much you all invested in teacher training. Um, it's really important to not just yes. assume that everybody is at the right level or that right, everybody right. can yeah. provide the Can I tell one anecdote yeah. about yeah. that? Because you may find it uh, hilarious, and you haven't heard this, so <laughs> I'll, I'll tell this to you as well. You know, I was one of those, one of those individuals leaving high school who, I, my dream was to become a primary school teacher when I left high school. I tr really wanted to do that, not only because my father was a primary school teacher and many people in our family was, but I felt that that's the job I want to have forever. So I applied once and I failed. I applied again, I failed again, because as, as you heard, it's, it's a very tough, it's, a, it's more difficult to get into primary school teacher education in Finland still than in a law school or medical, medical school. Amen. So I was not good enough to become a primary school teacher in Finland, so I ended up teaching at Harvard University and worked with the World Bank instead. <laughs> <laughs> like, many, like many others in Finland, yeah. the same story. <laughs> Peter. Um, you are one of the foremost innovators in the world, um, especially when it comes to technology. And um, one of the things that Tony Wagner says in his book, Creating Innovators, is that schools actually beat the innovation out of students. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel that growing up in the Finnish education system, or did you actually feel like your creativity was encouraged? Uh, I don't know if it was like encourage uh, in, in particular, but I, I think that uh, uh, it wasn't kind of like beaten out of us either. So, I mean, you have a lot of room of uh, room to do do things. And, and I, I think that this is also uh, one thing, and then kind of like maybe to understand this like true contrast that uh, I think that, um, you know, and why I always come back to this, uh, you know, short school, there's not a lot of homework. And I think it's important because uh, then, uh, uh, and there's a lot of discussion here that oh, we should make you know the school days longer because look at Asia you know they're killing us because you know like in China very long school days or Singapore very long school days and and, and all that but I think that uh, that and and actually what maybe also one one thing uh, that uh, I mean it's easy to kind of like criticize that okay the, the, the you know uh, educational system in the U.S. and uh, you know it's broken there's lots of challenges all that but I, I would actually argue that there's it's there's actually um, it, it's very good that there is. Um, 
uh, kind of like also uh, room to to kind of like be yourself and, and kind of like be creative. So I think that that's uh, like super important and, and also kind of like in the in the Finnish uh, model that because you have time to do other things. I mean again, uh, always you know like use the example that I was having afternoon tea in in Beijing with. Uh, the president of the Beijing Media University, and then he was telling me that that his wife is very concerned because uh, their 12-year-old son plays basketball. And then you know, like here or like in, in Finland, like you know, so what's the problem? I mean, it's great. He's into sports. You know, like fantastic, and you know, even basketball. And and then, but of course, it's bad because it's away from the academic achievement. It's away from school and all of that. So I think that uh, uh, I would say that we we're not. Um, uh, we're not necessarily like, uh, you know, focused on the creativity or, or anything like that, but because of these like short school days and like, and, and not having to spend like your home, whole evening and night, you know, sometimes doing homework, you have time to reflect and you have time to be creative. So, so I think that that's, that's probably like one of the, one of the reasons. And, and uh, then if you look at, you know, now, uh, then uh, um, that we, we created things uh, like if you look at Finland, like on the technology side, I mean Linux that you know pretty much like runs the internet and and uh, MySQL and and uh, you know then Angry Birds and like a few other games and, and, and all that. I think that when I'm asked that okay, how is it possible only five million people and you did all of these you know fantastic things, uh, then I always say that yeah, it's you know because of the fantastic education, but there you know the fantastic education, so it's what's happened in school, but also very important what doesn't happen in school. So yeah. I think that school doesn't have like a monopoly on, on, uh, on kind of like education or creativity. And, and, and here, you know, the thing is that if you don't have time, you know, simply don't have time during the day to do anything besides like study, 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 I mean, then yes, it kills initiative, it kills creativity. So, so I think that uh, maybe in Finland, because we have short school days, then, you know, the kids can actually be like creative on their own. Can I, can I add something here before Saku comes? Because I, I think it's, it's very important what Peter is saying there. And, um, and I, I told you that I, I spent, I lived five years in Washington, D.C., yeah. but I'm fine now. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I learned there, the kind of a difference between what Peter was talking about, the Finnish parents, and a kind of a ethos of, you know, being, being a child and or parent, uh, and this is now for all the parents, American parents here, is that what I learned was that the, the, the families, and particularly parents, are much more kind of obsessed to plan and program the lives of their children, not only during the week that there's a lot of things to do, but also the summertime that you have to, that you really feel like bad if you, if you have a week for your children when there's nothing, no, no program, no camp or something, something like that. And we are very comfortable in Finland to, you know, leave our children without any program or plan in the afternoons and evenings because that's where the, that's a kind of a creative space for young people to figure out what to do. And we have a very long summer holidays and it's a very rare that anybody would send their children to a summer school or summer camp or something like that. That's a time where, you know, the kids have to, we assume that, figure out what to do. You know, if you, if you feel bored, that may be a kind of a next, next step to the <laughs> inventing, creating something out of this thing. Uh, so I, I, I think that is a, is a harmful for many things by parents to think that, you know, the good schooling requires two or three hours homework every day or that you have to have you know, all the activities for Saturdays and Sundays and summer so that the kids are kind of active. In Finland, we think that the children are active when the, when the parents are not there and they, they kind of have to figure out themselves what to do. So that's a, it's, a, it's a big difference in, in you know, how we perceive uh, childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, this the whole, whole concept of creativity or innovation is, is interesting. And I think that in debate all over the world, we are putting too much, em for me, it consists of two things thinking and doing. So you come up with an idea and then you execute and then you change and then you execute again and so on. And I think that in education and discussion, in innovation discussion in general, we are putting too much emphasis on thinking and not enough emphasis on doing, testing, trying and so on. And I think that learning, learning by doing is a crucial part if you want to be teaching innovation. Okay. And, and when I'm discussing, for example, with education experts in the US about trying new things, the question I always end up with is how do you know it works? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when you are doing new things, you don't, That's no right. matter what you say. <laughs> and, and, and then, for example, uh, one anecdote from business side. Nokia, for example, 
they were making, in old days, they were making huge amount of, of studies about the future of mobile phones. And, and when the touch screen came, they knew that it wouldn't work. They knew they were certain because touch, business people don't want to have touch screens because they want to have keyboards. And it was a fact, it was not an opinion, and they were totally wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that in education we can have many things which means we know that this will work. And even if we have, have analysis that this will, this will work, it doesn't mean that it will in an uncertain world. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand these things. And then when you are talking, talking about lifelong learning, it's interesting, uh, I think that the things where, where most of the learning happens are the spaces when something didn't work. So it's crucial is that we tried this, it didn't work. What did, it, what did we learn out of this? But it's fascinating. One, one good friend of mine, uh, who is one of the best teachers uh, in Finland at the moment, Pekka Peura, who is teaching mathematics in a extremely innov innovative ways. And, and then the group of US, US people came to his class and, and said, that, but the ways you are teaching are so out of the box and so on, how do you know they work? And then, then Pekka Peura said, that, I can see it in the eyes of the kids. And then they were asking, yeah, but how do you measure it? That I can see it in the eyes, I don't measure, I trust because I'm with the kids daily. And this is interesting because if you wanna be trying new things and so on, you have to understand is that it's a leap, you don't know what works or whatever, you have to trust, you have to improve. I think one of the tensions though that educators feel, especially when you teach children from low-income backgrounds or children who yeah. are really struggling is, if I try something and it didn't work, I have this kid who I've failed immediately. <laughs> exactly. How do you reconcile that idea? Well, in, in, that, that's that's problem in schools, but that's the problem in business and, and, and so forth. And, and how, what is my, my own personal opinion regarding this one is that I stopped making mistakes. I haven't been kind of like, making mistakes in, in uh, I'd say, during the past 10 years, because I don't divide things in mistakes and successes. Okay. Uh, how I'm approaching is that, that if I wanna be innovative, if, if I wanna have a good life or whatever, I have to try new things. And when you try new things, some things work, some things don't, and that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. And then you can be learning from both. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing something which didn't work, but I learned something useful, I call it a success. Uh -huh. I don't call it a mistake. It's a redefinition exactly. of a mistake. I like it. Yeah, and there's there's another. If I, you know, look at some of those differences or, or um, kind of how, how we how we perceive things in a, in a in a different ways. Your your question about success or if somebody succeeds in a school, um, particularly this is particularly true in a primary school, maybe in middle schools as well in Finland, is that you know the the, the most important first success of every individual in a school is a well-being and health and happiness, because we we think uh, all of our teachers think that you cannot really learn, you cannot be successful in math or science or anything, unless you you are you have a kind of a good health and well-being and other but things. But that so, is a philosophically diametrically opposed opinion to what we believe in the United States, exactly. right? Exactly, but I don't understand why, 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 why it has to be like that all the time here, because it's so simple thing. Like, you know, if you go to any school in Finland, any primary or middle school or high school, you will find very easily, you know, all the basic health care and the mental care and the dental care, you know, all these counseling things, available in every single school. Can you, you find, say that one more time, please? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's let, a very, no, let, it's a let, very let important Let me continue, point. because this is not all. Every school in Finland, regardless of the, what type of kids they serve, uh, offers free, healthy, three-course meal for the children every day, everywhere, every school, because of this, it's, it's part of the health care. Every school in Finland has a, a, what we call the student welfare team. It's a group of experts that meet every week not to talk about the math scores or science scores or those things, they, they meet to talk about the well-being and health and happiness of children. Mm -hmm. uh, and they try to identify early on if there's anybody, any individual in a school that may end up in a trouble if we don't do anything. And that's a huge difference mm -hmm. that we, we do that systematically in every school in Finland and you do here in the United States, that's something that is primarily a responsibility of the parents. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when I speak here with the educators about this, I, I often hear people saying that but school is for learning, teaching and learning. It's, it's not the kind of a health healthcare center. But that's it is actually a healthcare center in Finland if you look at carefully what type of services and things children are receiving there. 
critical for success. Yeah. This is an EdTech conference, and so uh, when I visited Finland in June um, of last year, I was in schools and almost nowhere did I see a computer in a classroom. Um, talk to me about the role of ed tech in, in schools in Finland. Yeah, I'm, first of all, like, uh, I'm not like a huge fan of like the whole term ed tech. No, okay. so, so I think that that's already like, uh, uh, not like a good start. Uh, but but uh, I, I think that, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's not only like in education, but it's like in all areas of life that it typically uh, it's not about the technology. I mean, like the whole thing is that, uh, I mean, there is classic thing that, you know, like if you automate like a bad process in business, it's still a bad process. It might, you might execute like it faster, but it still, you know, doesn't really, you know, solve the problem. And, and I think that, uh, that it's also, uh, uh, and, and of course, I mean, people have now learned a little bit more, but, but it's not about like, okay, let's buy everybody iPads and then, you know, like we're done. I mean, it's just also like the, the whole thing, uh, uh, you know, if I look at what we're doing at Lightning with Big Bang Legends, that I mean, there are many, many people who are making learning games. And then we all know that nobody plays those because they're like not very good games. So it's not about just like, okay, let's, you know, like take technology, let's make this into a game. And then you wonder like, oh, why is it, you know, like nobody's using it and, and learning doesn't happen. So, so again, like the same thing as if you kind of automate something bad, it doesn't make it good. So, so uh, you have to, you have to start, like in our case, we make a great game and then learning happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that with like this whole ed tech discussion and all of that, that um, you can't uh, kind of like fix uh, kind of like the core of the problem with just like, okay, let's throw technology at it, let's get every kid in like an iPad and all of that. I, I think that it's, it's, it's not in the end about uh, the technology. And I think that here, here also, uh, uh, heard about, uh, and I, I think I totally agree that it's, it's really uh, very important that um, uh, we can like trust the teachers and then the teachers will also like figure out if there are ways, you know, okay, they can bring games to the classroom if it makes sense. But uh, again, uh, I don't think that we, we shouldn't kind of like get carried away by technology for technology's sake. And, and, and learning is no different from like any other business that, uh, that uh, I mean, at Lightning, we're not in the technology business. We're like in the entertainment and games business. And yes, we use technology, but uh, you know that that's kind of like enab it's an enabler for us, so that we can kind of like do what we do. But it, it's it's uh, we don't view ourselves as like a technology company. I had the opportunity to visit Lightning, and uh, mm -hmm. I would love for you to share a little bit about your early childhood classroom. Uh, yeah, that's actually yeah, yeah, that's an, uh, another activity that we we've been doing. So, uh, but but I, I think uh, actually uh, uh, I think that what what is very important and what is kind of like at the core of all of this, and I'm mean, forget about technology and, and uh, games and what have you. But but I think that uh, uh, we've been talking a lot about like making learning fun in general, and I think that you can use fun there as as kind of like uh, you know engagement, and and. Uh, of course, I mean, games are fun, so that's why people play games, and, 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 and that's, uh, I always use the example, I mentioned that earlier, uh, kind of like um, uh, this morning as well, that uh, since like the 80s, we've had this situation in Finland where boys speak better English than girls, and uh, it's because they play more games and the games happen to be in English. So again, it's, it's one of these examples that, that is, it's something that has kind of like happened by accident. So it's not the boys decide that, okay, let's speak better English than girls. And actually now that is something that is luckily evening up because now girls also play a lot of games. So it's, it's not, you can't really see that much of a difference anymore. But, but I think that it's, it's, it's again, uh, uh, the reason for that is that, okay, they want to learn English because they want to play the games. And, and I think that, uh, again, uh, if you look at like uh, with this fun learning and all of that, that uh, you have to have like a reason for learning. And I mean, if you can make le learning fun and all of that, then, uh, you know, it's not the worst answer a teacher can give that like when a, a student asks that, okay, why do we need to learn this? Y yeah, because it's going to be in the test. I mean, this, this is kind of like, uh, yeah, great. That's like super motivational. So I have to learn this, but like, is it like actually useful? So, so I think that, that that's uh, uh, one thing. And, and, and actually then on, on like uh, what we, in, in Finland, we also like, we, we do uh, a lot of work uh, in early years, like education, the early, early side uh, works like great. And I think that that's also um, because that's where you have like the biggest impact. And, and maybe there, uh, you know, what we uh, want to do, and I think that, uh, uh, again, understanding through an example that when 
uh, people moved to Finland from, from Kalak abroad, and then they put uh, their kids into, into Finnish daycare, into a Finnish kindergarten. Very often the parents will go to the, you know, the kindergarten teacher and say that, hey, you're not teaching the kids anything. You're just letting them play. And, and, and then, then, you know, like the whole, and that's like the whole point that we don't put two-year-olds sitting in a classroom and, you know, like, and, and uh, start their like academic career like very early. I mean, and this is again like very, very like uh, human that all of us, we learn to play. I mean, that's how we learn. I mean, that's, you learn how to walk by, you know, like you keep trying and failing and then like all of a sudden, hey, he or she is walking. And then I think that it's the same thing that we then like, we let kids be kids for as long as possible. I mean, we start school at seven. And, and uh, I think that this is something again that uh, actually in the early years educational that we let the kids play, but it's, it's also uh, the teachers there, I mean, they also have master's degree and they kind of like know what they're doing. So it's also kind of like directed kind of like play and they know what they're doing. So it looks like the kids are just playing and, and like having fun. But of course, what you learn by doing that, you know, you learn to interact with other kids. And every, anybody here, you know, and at this conference, I mean, it's probably like a pretty good skill to have to, you know, be a bit social and be able to talk to other people. So it's these kind of things, life skills that are super important. So much more important than then, you know, like being able to do like calculus when you're five or something like that. Uh, I'd love to make a comment on, on Pasi's definition of success because that's essential, but let's get back to that one in, in the very end. But about the digitalization, uh, maybe because for me, one of the crucial things about Finnish nature, Finnish character, Finnish culture, is being transparent, being brutally honest. And, and, and what you are saying is not totally correct, meaning that the, 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 there isn't the, the technology in Finnish classrooms or whatever. Because I think that we are almost exactly in the same problems as any country in the world. And, and one of the key problems is that the way the digitalization is happening in education is that you are buying huge amount of tablets and then, then you are turning textbooks into PDFs which don't really work, and then you put them to tablets that don't really work using Wi-Fi that doesn't exist. And, 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 and it's, it's amazing that every country after each other are making exactly the same mistakes. And that goes back to the culture of innovation, because there are brilliant examples of what digitalization could be done in the right way. But the problem is that no one knows about them. I'm asking, asking about which one of you have studied the high school of Öresund or whatever, and no one knows about those. And, and there are great examples on, on, on how, how to do it in a right way. And I think that it's, it's a massive shame that, that the whole education society in any country, we don't share the great examples and the bad examples. We all have, have to make our own mistakes and, 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 and so forth. So I think that that's one, one, of, the key, one of the key things we have, have to understand. But for me, the end of the digitalized, of course the schools have to be digital because the world is digital as well. But, but if we are trying to use the kind of like di digital devices, uh, for example, into one-on-one -on -one studying, into studying textbooks and so on, it makes absolutely no sense absolutely no sense, because books are in many cases better than the tablets for those cases. But, but you can use them for cooperation, collaboration, creation, creation across borders, doing new kind of things and so on, and then close the tablets or close the computers and do some, some other things as well, and it's about these balances. And there's huge amount of great examples all over the world, but we have to make them travel. So that's one of the key things. And in Finland, unfortunately, uh, we are also making same kind of mistakes as, 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 as any, any country in this space. That's my opinion. Peter, you talked earlier about stealth learning, mm -hmm. uh, tricking kids into learning, or right? not having them initially know that this is about mm -hmm. learning, but really about engagement. How are educators in Finland responding to the idea of stealth learning? Uh, I think that uh, it's actually, uh, uh, educators everywhere are, are uh, you know, responding very positively. And, 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 and I think that uh, um, it, it's again, uh, one of these things, because it's, it's kind of like very, 
natural. And I think that I mean, we use the stealth learning as one, one example that uh, you don't even realize you're learning because, I mean, like you're having, having so much fun, you're learning, you know, a lot of things without even realizing. Because always when we, you know, we let the kids, uh, you know, play our game, for example, for 15 minutes, and then we ask them, did you learn anything? And most uh, other kids will say that we didn't learn anything. It was a great game and it was fun, but we didn't learn anything. And then we asked them a few questions and it turns out that, that they actually learned. Uh, but, I, but I think that it's a little bit like the, the, like the kindergarten example of the parents being concerned that, hey, you're not teaching the kids anything. And I think that that's again, uh, you know, and to Saku's point there that, that um, you know, in, in many or pretty much like all over the planet, we're making the same mistakes that we're just like, okay, here, you know, have an iPad or, or something like that. But I, I think one, one thing here that, um, um, Kids, kids are, are, you know, of course, they're, they're smart, and, and we heard in the morning that anybody can learn anything, so there's, there's no excuse. And, and I think that uh, now what, what is happening with, uh, you know, uh, technology is that all the kids have a smartphone, pretty much. I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, happening everywhere, and, and it's not only like in developed uh, kind of countries, but I mean, if you go to Africa, okay, not every kid has a smartphone, but they, you know, like every kid starts to have a phone, and of course, give it a few years, and they're going to be like uh, much more capable devices. And that's again one thing that is great with the technology that like the prices are are coming down like very very rapidly, and that means that then uh, you know. Uh, uh, kind of learning is getting out of control, so you know anybody can play, for example, our game like anywhere. And uh, and um, great thing with games that they're like mostly free, even so. So again, we get this like uh, you know equal access for all all thing going. So so uh, uh, I, and but I think that it, it's not about you know like with stealth learning and all that. It's not really uh, tricking kids into you know doing something that they don't want to do. But I think that it's it's again it's more about uh, making that you know particular uh, learning process uh, fun, and I think that uh, you know also like made Saku's point there. But I think that if you look at most of education, it's not like we've had anybody look at the kind of like the service design, the experience design, mm -hmm. and and this is something that we do in games like all the time because I mean there are 700 new games hitting the market every day and if you don't get it right when you know people download that free game and in five seconds and they don't like it you're gone so I, and I think that this is also that that we need to challenge uh, you know the whole educational system that you need to actually design it uh, and uh, you know it's it's the physical and the digital you you can like you have to bring people there who know how to do these things and and let's say on, a, on kind of like a, I don't know, positive or, 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 or negative, no, but, but the thing is that it's also true for many businesses that they are not fantastic at service design. So, so uh, I think that, uh, you know, education is, uh, but education might be like a bit, bit uh, kind of further behind when it comes to this design thing. So Pasi, um, the Finnish schools have fallen slightly in the most recent PISA rankings. What do you think is going on and how is the education system responding? I, I think that there are two, and you're right, that the, you know, if you look at the 2015 and 2012 international results that the Finnish, Finnish schools of the Finnish system has been declining. I, I, I think, first of all, it's equally, equally complicated to explain exactly why that is than it is to, to explain exactly why Finland was good in the first place. So the, it's, it's a very, these are very complex systems to explain, but let me, let me share two things that I think are behind this. Um, first of all, that there is an actual decline in, uh, in among Finnish 15-year-olds uh, regarding particularly reading, lit li reading literacy. That's where the, the biggest decline has been taking place. And not across the board of the 15-year-olds, but particularly boys. 15-year-old boys have, you know, they're reading much less than they used to. And if you, if you don't read, then you don't learn how to read effectively, and that affects everything. So, so um, you know, if you look at the data available from the OECD, if the Finnish 15-year-old boys were as they, they are on average in all the other countries, meaning that the boys normally do a little bit better in science and math than girls, girls are better readers almost everywhere. If this was true in Finland, then Finland would be like Singapore. 
So we would be a very, very high performing. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's a fair to say that the Finnish girls are actually keeping Finland ah. uh, above the surface. Otherwise, if Finnish girls were like Finnish boys, now we would be doing really bad, like Sweden <laughs> <laughs> or Norway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's one thing. That make no mistake that there, there has been decline in actual learning and our own research and, and uh, studies in Finland indicate this as well. And it's a kind of alarm, uh, alarming. It's been a very rapid decline. Um, if you ask me why is this, what's, what's going on there, I would, I would look, look for the reasons for that decline uh, primarily outside of the school. The school has, there has n not been any significant change within our schools that would explain this type of decline. So those things are mostly related to uh, you know, what the teenagers do when they're not in a school. And you heard from Peter and, and others that we have a very relatively short school day, so the kids have much more time to do other things outside of the school. And, and that, that kind of a changed behavior that is not uh, about homework or going to the evening school like in Singapore, China, the kids do. It's something else that is not, not kind of a supporting this type of thing. So this is number one is that there is actual decline, but the similar decline is in almost all the other Western countries. And now you can see that also in China and Asian countries. So that the kids are not learning this traditional academic stuff as they used to do. Mm -hmm. But then the other one that I, I think is interesting here, that is explain at least proportion, part, part of the, the Finland's decline, is that you know, OECD has 35 countries now. 35 countries are taking part in this PISA and then there's uh, all sorts of other uh, systems there. But most of the, according to the research that we have done, most of those OECD countries now report that they have changed their policy and they have introduced education reforms and they have also changed resourcing so that it will, it, it should kind of boost and improve the PISA results. Uh, and it often means that there will be more time for teaching math and science and reading. There will be more professional development support for teachers who are teaching those subjects so that these kids will do well in this test. It's a, it's a little bit similar that you have seen here in America within your own as t kind of a state uh, testing, standardized testing systems that people are, uh, in many countries, people are kind of a trained and coached to do well in this test. And listen to this, in Finland we have done nothing, never in our school kind of a school development or, or education policies that would say that we do this because we want our PISA scores to go up. Mm -hmm. And for example, what we are doing now as a response to this decline is that we put more emphasis on arts and music and kind of an interdisciplinary approach, mm -hmm. which in practice will mean that the, those, who are, those teachers who are teaching, teaching math and science and reading literacy will have less time to mm -hmm. do what they used to do. So the Finnish response is kind of a odd that we are, we, are, we are doing exactly the opposite that the Americans have done, or many others, that you know, if kids don't learn mathematical reading, more curriculum um, and, and you know, more teaching instruction hours and more homework and more testing, so they're, they're really learning. But we are doing exactly the opposite thing. So those are the two, two things, that there, there, there is a kind of a decline of some sort, but then the other countries are you know, doing things that are targeted to, to doing well in this piece. It's a little bit like, you know, in a marathon, for example, any sport, that, you know, if you keep on running your marathon to two and a half hours, that I think all of us do here. Um, of course. Uh, <laughs> that, but, you know, if you do that year after year, you can see that your, your kind of a ranking in, in a league table of, of runners will decline. That you used to be, 20 years ago, if you did uh, two and a half hours in, in a normal run, you would be on the top. But now, two and a half hours is something that is like an average. And this is exactly the same in these international studies, that there's so many things, funny things going on that I often say that the OECD PISA is not really a neutral measure anymore. It doesn't tell the same things anymore that it used to do because of these things. Uh, just like the Olympics is not anymore the kind of a place where you go and see who is really the fastest or strongest or, 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 or the best because you never know what these people have been doing. Saku. Yeah, I mean, f fully agree with Pasi. Pasi said, said is that the Finnish reaction is odd, but I'd say that it's also beautiful. It's bold and beautiful. <laughs> no. uh, uh, so, so what I what, what is it, what, what I find extremely interesting at the moment is, is is that we are not talking enough about the fundamentals, meaning what is the purpose of education, and for me it's to help kids flourish in life no matter what happens, and then it goes back to happiness, it goes back to holistic life management skills, it goes back to curiosity, it goes back to creativity, 
it goes back to empathy, trying to understand differences and so on and so on. All beautiful, crucial things with only one problem. They are extremely difficult to measure or assess. And, and unfortunately, the assess testing business or assessment business is huge. Yeah. So my biggest worry is that we are introducing these skills to the schools and then we start measuring those. And when you start measuring curiosity or empathy on some scale created by some really complicated, and PISA, just like Pasi mentioned, PISA, PISA hasn't been extremely good in, in measuring those skills. They've been trying, but the problem OECD is having is that they found out like everyone else is that they are really complicated to measure. Yeah. Join me, my friends, in thanking these colleagues for sharing so many great